All right, we are being recorded. Um, welcome back, Woody. Thanks for thanks for uh, being willing to join join me again and continue our uh, discussion. Um, we had a couple of comments to the uh, the tape, the recording of our last session. Uh, if you're open to that, I'd like to start with start with those and uh, as a launching point. I, I'm, I'm delighted to, to do that. Okay. I also want to let the viewers know what we're going to try this time is to do this instead of one long recording. We're going to try to break it into like 15 minute or so segments. So at, at the end of the 15 minutes, um, I'll comment and just stop the recording and then start it up again. Um, so I want people to know that. Uh, and I need to start my timer because otherwise... I tend to forget. Um, so let me just open up. You all won't see it, but I will. The first comment we got was from a Stephen Northington, in uh, who's in. Where is he? Uh, I forget. Arkansas. Um, he doesn't say. Uh, it, it, it's pro it's in here somewhere. Uh, yeah, Arkansas. Um, so he he posts some very nice comments, and then talks about. I believe the biggest impact we can have to promote change in our state is to educate the public about alternative dispute resolution, um, and. In an interesting way, I believe this will be kind of like the Arab Spring, where the people will change the system long before our attorney profession will, or at least quicker anyway. Uh, he hopes to be a part of this and uh, feels like his firm can be. Uh, he's working with social media. And then he says, my question for you is, what impacted your career? that made you realize that traditional litigated divorce was not always the best way for your clients? And he has a follow-up. And do you feel that educating the client is a solid foundation to impact and change in our state versus expecting attorneys to change on their own? It's a very thoughtful question. Yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I think it's synergistic. I think all of, all of these factors work together in uh, creating the kind of change that is necessary. And it's 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 been going on for a long time. Collaborative practice, I, I would think, should uh, pair up um, happily with the mediation movement in um, an effort to institutionalize. Um, in society. In fact, um, over 10 years ago, I wrote an article called Institutionalization of Mediation for the Family Court Review. I'd be pleased to send it to anybody who um, doesn't have it. Um, and it really talks about a top to bottom uh, integration of the areas of peacemaking and um, society. Uh, um, and that that goes everywhere from the way courthouses are designed to the way that we as professionals work with our clients. Um, I think that uh, we can do it client by client. It has to be done that way um, because no matter how generalized um, the, the views, um, we have someone with a real life uh, family situation that needs um, needs help, and I think when I'm if I'm in practice, that's my first priority is the person in front of me. On the other hand, there are systemic and societal generic changes that can happen. We just have to look to Maryland, which is our bellwether state, when it comes to what they've done with mediation. Um, Justice Bell in uh, Maryland has become a folk hero um, from his appellate perch, um, promoting mediation and promoting the 
um, state to give money for uh, electronic media and advertising and billboards and bumper stickers and mediation days. Um, and from everything I can tell from my Maryland colleagues, it's had a real impact. So it motivates people to ask for services, and it motivates um, the professionals to um, gear up to provide this consumer approach. Um, let me give you one other example. Oh, I'm sorry, Carl Michael, why don't we go first with you, and then I will talk about a letter from um, a presiding judge in um, a family law court, which was another type of um, uh, help uh, to get everyone into collaborative and mediation. I, the question that came to my mind, and I, I hear you very clearly saying it is not an either or. And, and um, from my perspective, I, I, I've come to see that as almost the, the trap we lay for ourselves, trying to figure out which we do. Um, in terms of addressing the public education, what you've been discussing so far is really um, kind of focused on once they hit the courts, which is very important. But can, do you have any thoughts on how we might, um, you know, I, I, I know it, it, collaborative practice has been applied to divorce for a lot longer than to other matters, but it, it's the same problem, and we haven't solved it in divorce either, divorce yet, even with a long head start. Um, currently, for the most part, people, when they run into a problem with another person, um, their first thought of recourse is to sue. Do you have any thoughts? Is it something we could address um, to get the public at large thinking first about how can we resolve this thing as opposed to how can we go to court over it? Well, I'll go back further. How do we prevent conflict in the first instance? Yeah. How do we plan nice. our, um, our human and legal affairs mm -hmm. so that we can maximize our uh, greatest goals and greatest desires and minimize the potential of it going wrong and devolving into a, into a conflict or a dispute. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're speaking my language, Carl Michael. I mean, um, uh, in my office, I mentioned a client library lab in our lab for a session. What I didn't say it was who was it named after. It was named after Lewis M. Brown, the father of preventive law. Mm -hmm. He devoted 50 years plus in um, developing a field where the maxim was people shouldn't be in trouble if they don't have to be. And he developed it for companies that naturally try to manage risk, and he developed it with legal health checkups and wellness checkups and uh, for individuals so that individuals can stay out of trouble asymptomatically mm -hmm. when there's no dispute arising and can learn from problems Symptom symptomatically, how not to get in trouble again. Okay. He is imprinted in me. His, his picture, his photo is in my office, in my training room. I think about prevention of conflict in the first instance constantly. There is a program at Cal Western University on preventive law and creative problem solving. Hmm. It, is, it is the area of the future. So I could not agree with you more that the work that we do, um, I can give you strategies for doing it, but just talking conceptually, um, 
uh, to me, a collaborative uh, divorce or business situation or a mediation is already a failure. It's already a failure because there's been a conflict. Hmm. Now, it's certainly a better solution, a more elegant solution than litigation or adversarial posturing. However, what we need to look for, and um, when I was at, I, w- I was the chair of a, a task force to develop a peacemaker museum that might lead one day, um, uh, that might lead one day to a different um, approach, like a um, Department of Domestic Dispute uh, Prevention and Resolution. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That is either like NIH or works for the government. I mean, these are big ideas. Um, I don't know if our colleagues tuned in to talk about um, these kinds of theoretical constructs, but as long as you raised it, thank you. Well, it, it, it strikes me as a very important part of it because what we face when, when the client comes to us, we are facing as collaborative professionals um, an uphill battle because they've ne- they frequently have not heard of collaborative practice. And um, so we're, we're working, we're working on the side, <laughs> my biases are going to, I'm just going to let my biases come out. We're talking on the side of angels and they go, and they're coming from their friends and family who are saying, kill, 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 you must win. Um, so they're, they're surrounded by a lot of fear until they come into the office. Um, and we try to uh, move them out of fear into constructive dialogue with uh, with the other person, other party. I, it, there were two things that came to my mind also while you were talking. One was um, there's a lot. Of, there's been a lot of programs that have developed out of the restorative justice program in uh, restorative justice movement, rather, uh, programs in high schools where dispute resolution, uh, um, peer resolution of disputes is set into place. And it might be, maybe that's an avenue that we could pursue uh, locally in each each of our locales, not stopping only at doing presentations to, um, you know, divorce groups or, you know, business resolution, business problems, but let's take something to the high schools themselves right there and start people working with individuals who are just forming the idea of how do they handle matters where they're not getting along with somebody else. And well, uh, uh, again, Lou Brown was um, 50 years ahead of us. Okay. He established something called, called the Blue Car Project for high schools. Uh-huh. And it was, it was a way for um, uh, teenagers to learn about, to learn about um, the uh, legal aspects of a car how to buy one, how to co-own it, liability, contracts, um, uh, preventively um, learning how to drive, all kinds of things. And it was a, it was a brilliant concept. It still lives on here in Los Angeles. Um, and the peer mediation programs that are in throughout the, the country in primary schools and, and middle schools and High schools. These are all programs uh, designed to teach young people these kind of um, uh, uh, skills and perspectives. In fact, there's been some studies that show that those children who learn about conflict prevention and conflict resolution stand up more to bullying and are not as um, swept away in the in the mob mentality. So it, it teaches better citizenship, too. Um, okay. Yes, I think we in the collaborative field are, are, are very much a part of this peacemaking um, uh, 
uh, movement. And when you talk about restorative justice, um, I recently, recently, uh, a year and a half ago, taught a course at Hamlin University in Minneapolis and uh, St. Paul about um, uh, the lawyer as peacemaker in society. Hmm. And in yeah. that, um, in that uh, uh, course, we we looked at at models like the Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, and other aspects of restorative justice, and I've tried to apply them to civil disputes and um, and public policy. And in fact, um, in um, the master class that I teach with uh, Pauline, we, we do talk about the role of apology and of, um, of um, reconciliation. And you were there, you, you know. Uh, and so it's, it's part of, I think, the work that, that we are um, all committed to. It's fascinating. We've got it, that, we've gone for 15 minutes. That's that, that it, it's the blink of an eye. Um, before we before we break and 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 come right back, um, I want to. Are you familiar with? Um, I don't know where it stands right now, but I I had, you know I'm acquainted with Marianne Williamson's work, and so I've um, kind of kept track of of her stuff and through her work um, become aware of, I think it's Dennis Krasinich who has been spearheading a movement for a department of peace in the U.S. government. That um, that would be an interesting uh, thing to see evolve. Perhaps we could get behind that in some, um, in, in some loose way. It would be, wouldn't be a bad idea to have, um, you know, government, Support for the kind of efforts that we are that we are talking about here. Uh, there are institutions that, that support that, and I'll uh, be glad to talk about that more. I, I, I know you want to okay. sort of cut now. Yeah, so I'm just going to stop the recording and then start it right back up so that it comes as separate uh, trailers. <laughs> 